Thank you for downloading this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found at local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Chip Ford, and I will be your host for today's episode titled, Salt and Pepper Shakers. In almost every home across the United States, there exists a pair of small containers, usually made from glass, plastic, ceramics, or metal, and usually with the distinct markings of a large S and a large P. I am of course referring to salt and pepper shakers. You may be thinking to yourself, What sort of history can be told from ordinary salt and pepper shakers? In this episode, we will examine several sets of salt and pepper shakers that can be used to explain the broader theme of early tourism in the Central Florida area. What links all of the items examined in today's episode is that they are used as souvenirs. Souvenirs are purchased to commemorate a time and place outside the buyer's ordinary experience, usually what they find extraordinary. Therefore, the study of souvenirs can tell us much, not only about the object itself, but about the purchaser of that object. We talked to Andrea Luden, administrator of the Salt and Pepper Shaker Museum in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, who talks about the subject of early salt and pepper shakers as souvenirs. Souvenirs are, are not a necessity. Souvenirs are trinkets. There, there wasn't a lot of trinket buying uh, or what you'll find like in the 1800s, the condiment uh, containers were also known as cruets, which is usually uh, three, three or more items that you place in a tray or in some kind of a holder. And it would usually have a salt and a pepper, a mustard pot, uh, oil and vinegar. But it wasn't something, it wasn't just a, a, a dispensable item that, souven- that these roadside souvenirs became after World War II. Early souvenir salt and pepper shakers, then, were utilitarian in fashion. One of our sets of shakers fits this description. The item's official title is number 83 thumbprint model avocado, but most would recognize it as the Airco salt and pepper shaker set. In 1939, Claremont, Florida resident William F. Nagel received patent number 2160602 for his design of salt and pepper shakers. What separated his dispensers from the rest was the small ring of diatomite, a mineral mined from the lakes around Claremont they kept salt and pepper dry and protected it from humidity, which, as anyone who has ever lived or visited Florida can attest to, is extremely high. Due to its ability to keep salt and pepper dry, the Airco sets then would make ideal utilitarian souvenirs for tourists visiting Florida in the early to mid-20th century. As to the manufacture of early souvenir salt and pepper shakers, Andrea Luden gives us more insight. The, the earlier salt and pepper shakers were more utilitarian. It doesn't mean that they didn't have a lot of design in them. They, they don't just look like a cylinder or just a container. They, they were actually very intricately designed, um, a, a lot of artistry, um, detailing, things like that that can be found because, again, these were prior to the 1900s. It, it was, they were more of, um, of an artisan creation. So there was a lot of time involved in them, the detailing, the workmanship. Then once the items became more mass-produced, you can start to see how it starts to kind of mm, not quite be as, as rich as it used to be before. Who were these early tourists to Central Florida that bought souvenir salt and pepper shakers? In the late 19th and early 20th century, travelers to Central Florida either utilized steamboat or railroad travel. However, as the 20th century progressed and the automobile became the preferred mode of transportation into Florida, a new type of tourist arose, the tin can tourist. We asked Dr. Tracy Revels from Wolford College to explain the differences of the tin can tourist 
from previous visitors to Florida. One of the biggest ways that tin can tourists were different is that tin can tourists were ordinary Americans. Most of the tourists who'd come to Florida before the 1920s were wealthy people, the elite. But tin can tourists, well, just about any American could afford a Model T and perhaps to modify it a little bit and turn it into a camper. And so the tin can tourists were people who could maybe get a month or two off and travel down to Florida and have a little bit of an adventure because with their own car, their own vehicle, they were freed from having to travel on the railroad or having to stay at a hotel. They didn't have to give tips to anybody. It really cut the cost of travel down in Florida. It was the car that really opened up the being able to go a long distance and stay for a longer time for average Americans because they simply couldn't afford the train tickets and the long hotel stays that would have come before. And another thing with the cars was they simply would sleep in their cars or pitch a tent, and they could do it pretty much in any field or by the side of the road anywhere in the state of Florida back in those days. Dr. Revels discusses more about the businesses that arose which catered to the needs of the tin can tourist. There were a lot of little mom-and-pop hotels that sprang up along the Florida roads catering to tourists. There were also what they called tourist camps, which would grow up, especially in central Florida and uh, around Tampa and Miami, that would offer some real basic amenities, maybe a bathhouse, place to take a shower, uh, maybe some different sorts of eating facilities, even a bandstand and a place to have a local dance. So often tin can tourists would congregate in these auto camps or tourist camps, and that would bring a lot of stimulus to the local economy. One thing that's interesting, however, is that some communities in Florida actually debated whether or not they wanted tin can tourists there or not, because there was also a fear that maybe these people wouldn't really be very nice people, that they'd be riffraff or they would be, um, you know, thieves or something. So there was a good bit of debate, is, is this money worth the risk? And some towns said yes, and some towns said no. And obviously the towns that said yes were the towns who did a lot better of harvesting the economic benefits of tin can tourism. Where, then, was the outlet for tin can tourists to purchase their souvenir salt and pepper shakers? For some, it was at the small mom-and-pop souvenir stores that sprung along the main routes into Florida before and after World War II. We talked to Executive Director Emeritus Dr. Nick Wynn of the Florida Historical Society to expound on what sort of place a mom-and-pop souvenir store was like at this time. As soon as you pass that Florida line, you had mom-and-pops, you had gator farms, because many of these mom-and-pop stores realized you got to have something more than just knickknacks, and so they would create alligator farms and various little zoos, and you could stop, and it was always... Uh, a great place to stop and keep in mind that this was before the days of automobile air conditioning and the speed limits were still reduced uh, to 45, 50 miles an hour. And so children always demanded to stop and what better thing than to take them and show them 50 alligators all clumped together. Another line of inquiry asks, besides the Airco company, who else was manufacturing salt and pepper shakers for sale at these mom and pop souvenir stores? Andrea Luden gives us some answers as to who was manufacturing these items and why. But one of the things that um, that really helped with the industry of souvenirs was actually the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, a lot of the companies, the, the ceramic companies found in the Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan area, they started to suffer along with uh, all the other industries uh, in the country. And so they started concentrating on making smaller items. And that was the first little bleep of small containers uh, like salt and pepper shakers. There, there was also a labor force that was available that was very cheap. And it was, you know, the, the government trying to get people to, uh, to have work and jobs and keeping them busy. 
And uh, once the U.S. started coming out of the Great Depression, there was a little bit more money, but it also meant that the labor force was getting more expensive. So when World War II came around, there, there was a time when Japan uh, was occupied uh, by the U.S. forces, and one of the things that the U.S. government decided to do was to kickstart the Japanese economy, and so they kind of made like a partnership. Uh, the Japanese had a cheap labor force. The U.S. had uh, the, the know-how of the factories for household items and things in general just to, to sell. So they went ahead and uh, sent several representatives from the different companies found in the Ohio uh, River Valley, Michigan, and Pennsylvania to Japan to uh, help those factories come back up and also market and create items that could be sold in the U.S. market. Much like the ancient Silk Road trade routes that brought goods from Asia into Europe, this new line of commerce, one could call it the Souvenir Road, brought small manufactured items from Asia into Florida. Ironically, these items that were made overseas would then be purchased to commemorate or memorialize a visit to Central Florida. Many events and developments led to the end of tin can tourism. Nick Wynn offers up some of the reasons as to why tin can tourism ceased to be the popular method of visiting Central Florida. There was a decline. One was um, the fact that uh, as a result of World War II, there were very little unexplored territory in Florida. Uh, roads were certainly uh, constructed. You had the rise of the interstate in the Eisenhower administration. You had reliance on air travel. You had uh, uh, the rise of the motels, it wasn't necessary to go camp out and explore the unknown. You could get an air-conditioned cabin or room. Uh, and, and slowly but surely, what happened was that you began to channel the automotive tourism into larger areas. Tourism to Central Florida did not disappear, but rather the dominant method of tourist travel changed. One thing that has not disappeared is the souvenir salt and pepper shaker. The methods used to obtain them may have changed, but the object itself still remains to be purchased as a reminder of visiting Central Florida. The next time you find yourself next to a shelf of souvenir salt and pepper shakers with flamingos and Florida written on the side, you might think twice about dismissing them out of hand now that you know that there is a history behind that object. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. For more information about the salt and pepper shakers featured in this podcast, please visit the Claremont Historical Village at 490 West Avenue, Claremont, Florida, 34711, and the Orange County Regional History Center in Orlando at 65 East Central Boulevard. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled Rollins College Collegiate Wear.